What's going on folks, Ted from Nerd Immersion here and we are back on our regular schedule having done the shopping list last week. Also, sorry this is on a Thursday and not a Tuesday, but this time I'm going to be giving you my top 10 magic items for sorcerers. Thankfully with Tasha's Cauldron, a lot more were added that are useful for sorcerers. So if you're a sorcerer player or have one in your game and want to know what kind of rules and specifics are going to be here, stay tuned. Nothing too crazy, although we did take a week off and some people may just be watching this video for the first time. So the specifics for what we're gonna do in this video is just to give you some idea of the parameters for what we're covering. We're only covering official content, meaning stuff published by Wizards of the Coast or direct affiliates, not things like third party, Cobalt Press, Ghostfire Gaming, etc. right? Only first party stuff. We're only gonna cover up to very rare rarity because legendary magic items are maybe you get one in a campaign, if that. So no legendary magic items. We're not gonna do any consumable magic items, right? Things like potions or scrolls. We're also not gonna do anything that has a limited number of charges that when expended is gone forever. Things like a chime of opening, for example. Lastly, we're also not going to cover anything like the tomes or manuals or books that you can read that increase one of your ability scores, as those are useful for everybody. And the goal for this is to be subclass agnostic. Whether you are playing, you know, a wild magic sorcerer or an aberrant mind sorcerer, this list will be useful for you no matter what. Now, some things might be more useful for one class than the other, but everything here will be useful for a sorcerer regardless of what kind you choose to play. Let's dive in. Number 10. The Elven Chain. I also want to apologize for having finished starting this video on a Monday, basically when I had originally started recording on a Thursday. But either way, uh, this non-attunement rare magic item comes to us from the basic rules. And the main thing here is this is a plus one chain shirt armor that gives you proficiency in it even if you're not proficient with medium armor. To give you a frame of reference, chain shirts... Uh, are 13 plus your dexterity modifier to a maximum of two. So if you have at least a 14 or higher dexterity, you'd be sitting at a nice 15 AC because this is a plus one chain shirt. That means 16. And again, as a sorcerer, you are normally not proficient with any forms of armor. This gives you proficiency with it just by it itself. And again, it is non-attunement. So I really like the Elven chain specifically for sorcerers, but again, anybody that doesn't have proficiency with medium armor, that isn't hampered in any way by wearing armor, right? It doesn't really make sense to put this on a monk because they don't get they get a better benefit to not wear armor. Uh, but yeah, I mean, also, if you know this is coming up early on, you might only, say, put 14 points, uh, you know, do a, a dexterity of 14, knowing that it caps out at 2. But with a 14 dexterity and an elven chain, you're sitting at a nice 16 AC, which is pretty solid. Uh, you don't have to expend a spell on mage armor, and it also is beneficial because I think... Mage armor is kind of a, a wasted use of one of your spells known because depending on the type of sorcerer you are, you're pretty limited in what options you have. Number nine. The Helm of Teleportation. This rare attuned magic item comes to us from the basic rules. And I've talked about this before. One, I actually love the design of the helmet itself, but it has three charges and you can use an action to expend charge to cast teleport from it and it gets a D3 charges da back daily at dawn. It's nice because even if you expend the final charge of this helmet, it doesn't risk the chance of being destroyed or lost. Also, I feel like as a sorcerer, teleport is a very useful spell, but given the fact that you are so limited, again, I say that, but if we look at the more recent sorcerer subclasses, things like the Aberrant Mind, Clockwork Soul, and more, even more specifically, the new Lunar Sorcery, sorcerer those all do give you expanded spell options which is nice but i do think that for the most part teleport is better relegated to a wizard who can easily swap those spells in and out on a long rest however the helm of teleportation gives you three uses of it i would imagine three uses per day is probably all you will ever need depending on how much 
you know, hopping around the world you do, and having it relegated to a helmet is nice, and ultimately, if you don't need it, you can pass the helmet on to somebody else, because again, this also works on something like a fighter, but I think it's cool for the sorcerer. I also like the concept of the elven chain from last. You got the chain shirt on with this cool sort of, you know, armored helmet. I think it's a cool combo and not something you often see when you think about a sorcerer, you know, just a traditional caster type. Number eight. The Blast Scepter. This very rare attunement magic item comes to us from Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage. And honestly, this was a runner-up for something that's useful for literally anybody to have. Uh, it doesn't, you don't need to be a spellcaster to use it. It can be used as an arcane focus if you do happen to need to use one, but it gives you resistance to lightning and thunder damage, and that possibly by itself makes it worthwhile. You don't even need to necessarily even use it. Just having it and being attuned to it gives you resistance to two very common damage types, but also as an action, you can use it to cast Thunder Wave as a fourth level spell with a save DC of 16 without expending a spell slot. And I've had to explain this in the past, so I will explain it again now. It has unlimited uses of a fourth level DC 16 Thunder Wave. Now, you may possibly, as a sorcerer, have higher than a DC 16 spell save by the time you would normally get access to a very rare magic item. You may have that. But this is something that you could cast constantly without ever expending a spell slot, and it's already at 4th level, which I think puts it at 4d8 damage, because it's normally base Thunder Wave is 2d8. Yeah, so this is a AoE 4d8 spell you could do constantly without expending a spell slot, and again, it gives you resistance to two extremely common damage types. The only downside is, in theory, there is, depending on how your DM feels about it, there is like one Blast Scepter that exists in Waterdeep Dungeon of the Mad Mage, but if they're just pulling from magic items from a list of anything very rare or lower, Blast Scepter should be one of the top priorities uh, if you're able to snag one. Number seven. The Cloak of Arachnida. This very rare attunement magic item comes to us also from the basic rules, and this is a nice utility uh, magic item that possibly uh, allows you to limit what spells you have, right? Or, I mean, or allows you to take other spells, right? Spider Climb, I think everybody would argue that Spider Climb is a very useful spell to have, as is Web, especially at lower levels. But this will not only give you both of those, it will also give you resistance to poison damage. So in theory, if you were to happen to luck into the Cloak of Arachnida and a Blast Scepter, just with those alone, you'd have resistance to poison, lightning, and fire damage. This also gives you a climbing speed equal to your walking speed, and as such, you can do spider climb walking on any kind of vertical surfaces. Also, you can't be stuck in any webs or difficult terrain caused by webs, and it also gives you the ability to, as an action, cast the web spell that is limited to once until the next dawn. However, it fills twice its normal area, but the DC is stuck at a 13. Again, it's a nice utility magic item. I think this is pretty useful. It saves you possibly taking two spells that you might want to swap out later. Again, having the ability to spider climb is always useful, but then also giving you resistance to one of the most common damage types in the game, as well as the ability of a large area web, which can be used for all sorts of sets up, setups and combos, is a pretty useful magic item all around. Number six. The Wand of Fireball or Lightning Bolts. Uh, these are a pretty standard practice for basically any spellcaster out there. But uh, this Attunement Magic Item comes to us from the basic rules. It is also a rare magic item. Uh, it does set the DC at 15, and it is one of those ones where if you expend the last charge, you have to roll a 20, and if you roll a 1, it's destroyed. But you can potentially get out of this a free 6 castings of Fireball a day, or Lightning Bolt if you happen to go with the Wand of Lightning Bolts. I often feel people consider Sorcerers to basically be the Blasting class, not that Wizards aren't either, but I, it's just for whatever reason, I think people tend to think of Wizards as having damage, but also a lot of utility, whereas they think Sorcerers seem to focus more on the damage, and I think that is purely based on the limited spell selection, but with you are casting Fireball from this, so you have meta magic options and things of that nature, so... Why not, you know, if you want to lean into the nature of being the blasty type, possibly save your spell slots and your spells known for something else and just use something simple again, like a wand of fireballs or lightning bolt. Number five. 
the Robe of Stars. This very rare Tomb of Magic item comes to us from the basic rules. And first of all, I love the aesthetic and the design of this robe. I think it looks fantastic. Uh, and it gives you a plus one bonus to saving throws while you wear it, which is nice. And each one of those little red stars that you see there can be plucked off to fire off a fifth level magic missile. Daily at dusk, a D6 stars reappear on the robe. So again, it has six, and that is a fifth level magic missile, which it starts off at three missiles at first level, second, third, fourth, fifth, you are firing seven magic missile darts with each one of the castings here. It says while you wear it, you can also use an action to enter the astral plane along with everything you are wearing and carrying. You remain there until you use an action to return to the plane you are on. You reappear in the last place uh, you uh, occupied, and then again, you are pushed to the nearest space. So not only does it give you the benefit, the passive bonus of a bonus to your saving throws, you have the potential six uses of a high-level magic missile, and possibly could get all six of them back every day at dusk. You also have this sort of potential useful but also panic button an option of just getting to the astral plane now possibly you can use that for traversal or to seek things out within the astral plane but you are going to reappear where you had left but as far as you can tell you can stay in the astral plane essentially as long as you're physically able to do so before you can just snap right back as an action and i think that's a pretty useful item overall and again the aesthetics are on point number four the various shard-based magic items that were introduced in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. They all do something similar. So here is the Astral Shard. You can see these are all tied to like different planes, whether that be Elements or the Astral Sea, the Feywild, and so on. And they basically all do something unique, right? So, for example, the Astral Shard as an action, you can attach it to... I think they all have this uh, as a weapon, a piece of jewelry... Um, and it could be your spellcasting focus. And for example, the Astral Shard is when you use a metamagic option on a spell while you're holding or wearing said shard. Immediately after casting the spell, you can teleport to an unoccupied space you can see within 30 feet of you. And they basically all have something like that based on when you use a metamagic feature while you have it. Uh, the Elemental one has four different options. Um, I like the Astral Shard as a personal pick because the free teleport is nice. Uh, the Feywild one can be fun, I guess. It's a wild magic surge. I think the Far Realm one, if I recall, was pretty good. Uh, you cause a slimy tentacle to rip through the fabric of reality and strike one creature you can see within 30 feet of you. They must make a charisma saving throw or take 3d6 psychic damage and become frightened of you until the start of your next turn. And remind you, this is just happening in the background when you use a metamagic item. So it's not like you need to use or expend charges beyond this. If you're going to use your own metamagic regardless, you can then tap into one of these powers. So again, this is nice because it's potential extra damage and a frightened condition. Uh, Outer Essence has, again, a couple of them based on, has actually potentially some healing, temp HP or damage based on the type of uh, plane. Uh, you roll a d4, right? You can cure a creature. You can see within 30 feet of you uh, with one of these following conditions, charm, blind, and deafen, frightened, poisoned, or stunned. Uh, you can provide disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks for a creature or give somebody within 30 feet uh, 3d6 hit points or have somebody take 3d6 damage. I like this one probably the best because like that 3d6 necrotic damage, there's no saving throw. Um, it's when you take when they take damage from the spell, um, basically well, from whatever spell you're casting with this attached, uh, they just take extra damage. Shadowfell is... Um, but you can basically get a displacement style effect. And then that is basically it. So I really like these. Like I said, I think the Astral Shard and the Outer Essence Shard are probably my two favorites. But again, they are all attunement. Their rarities vary for the most part. They're mostly rare magic items. And they have a lot of unique options. And it taps into something you're already going to be utilizing your meta magic. So they're kind of like a nice thing that can sit in the background until you decide to use a meta magic option. Uh, and then, again, it'll fire off, and you'll see what happens. Number three. The Staff of Defense. This rare attunement magic item actually comes to us from Lost Mine of Fandelver, and it is actually a super useful defensive item. First of all, while holding the staff itself, it gives you a plus one to your armor class, which is nice, 
and it has 10 charges which can be used to cast one of the following spells. The trigger here is though, it says while you hold the staff, you can use an action to cast one of the following spells if it is on your class's spell list. Mage armor for one or shield for two. You require no components to do so. It gets a D6 plus four charges back daily at dawn, but it will possibly disintegrate if you use the last charge and then roll a one. Not only is this giving you a flat out innate plus one to your armor class, it also is potentially getting you at least four free castings of shield and one casting of mage armor per day with no downside. And as long as you have those spells on your spell list, that's the kicker. So again, primarily, this is very useful for something like a sorcerer or a wizard. But if you happen to be a subclass that has access to something like shield on it, I think there's a artificer subclass that might have shield. This may be beneficial for you as well. Number two. The Staff of Power. This very rare attunement magic item can only be attuned to by a sorcerer, warlock, or wizard and comes to us from the basic rules. And this is basically the strongest, very rare staff that we have. It gives you a plus two bonus to attack and damage rolls made with it as it is a quarter staff, but it also gives you a plus two bonus to your armor class, your saving throws, and your spell attack rolls, which is a fabulous defensive capability. Not only can it be used as just a stick to hit people, plus two to your AC saving throws and your spell attack rolls is awesome. It also has 20 charges. It gets 2d8 plus four charges back daily at dawn. Again, if you roll a one and use the last charge, you can potentially lose it. It'll just become a plus two quarter staff. Um, you can use uh, and expend one of the charges to deal an extra d6 force damage to a target you hit. But probably the big option is the bunch of different spells that it has within it. Uh, uses your spell save attack and spell attack bonus. Cone of Cold for five charges. A fifth level Fireball for five charges. Globe of Invulnerability for six. Hold Monster for five. Levitate for two. Lightning Bolt uh, at fifth level for five. Magic Missile for one. Ray of Enfeeblement for one. Or Wall of Force for five. That is a large variety of high damage, but also good utility spells with things like Globe of Invulnerability and Wall of Force. And then it also has the uh, the last ditch, oh shit, effort of Retributive Strike, where you can basically break the staff over your knee and cause it to explode, dealing damage based on the number of charges it has left, potentially up to 80 points of damage to anyone within 10 feet of it if they fail their dexterity saving throw. Uh, you also have a 50% chance to travel to a random of, uh, plane of existence, avoiding any damage from the explosion. It's pretty powerful and iconic, and I actually kind of like it better because of all the defensive capabilities it also provides. Number one. The Bloodwell Vial. This various attunement, ma various rarity attunement magic item, it can only be attuned to by a sorcerer and comes to us from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Something that we've seen a lot from Tasha's Cauldron are these rarities that vary, uh, where uncommon provides plus one, rare provides plus two, and very rare provides plus three. If you have this item, um, uh, let's see, uh, you can use it as a spell casting focus for your spells, and it also provides a bonus to your spell attack bonus and your spell save DC equal to its rarity, right? So if you have a very rare version of this, it provides you a plus three bonus to your spell attack rolls and a plus three bonus to your sorcerer spell save DCs. Also, uh, whenever you roll any hit dice to recover hit points while you are carrying it, meaning something like a short rest or potentially if you have any other means of rolling hit dice, uh, you regain five sorcery points. That can't be used again until the next dawn. So this combos very well, uh, well with something like one of the shards that we talked about, whereas this can give you back five sorcery points, boosting your overall abilities, allowing you to cast more meta magic, which can tap into the innate abilities of some of the various shards that we discussed. This is a fantastic magic item. It's definitely the best thing you can get on a sorcerer, getting meta magic uh, or more sorcery points back for just for free. Uh, whenever you roll hit dice, like I said, this could be over the course of a short rest, or if you have some other means of rolling hit dice in combat, you could possibly get more sorcery points back during. And again, a just a flat out bonus to spell attack rolls and spell save DCs really just can't be beat in the long run. So there you go, folks. That is my top 10 magic items for the sorcerer. Sorry this came out so late and compared to when I had planned for it to come out. Uh, stuff just got away from me, but here we are. So thank you all so much for watching. Thank you to my patrons over on Patreon for continuing to support me and the channel. And I will see you all 
next time. 